Thank you for coming tonight for this uh, budget information session. As you know, we've been going around uh, uh, various parts, in particular in Suva, and we're here in Nabua today. We were in Nasori a couple of nights ago, and um, we'll be going to the west uh, from Wednesday onwards. Uh, the way that we do do this is that uh, I, do, I give a very short presentation uh, in respect to what are the key features of the budget and some of the economic fundamentals that we've taken into account and why we've done certain things. And then we'll open up the floor for any questions you may have uh, regarding the budget. And of course, anything related to the, uh, to the economy. So we'll start off with that. I've been accompanied uh, this evening by the Permanent Secretary for Economy. And of course, we've got the Head of Fiscal, uh, sorry, our PSV Economy, Makrita Konrote. And the PS for Economy is here, uh, the PS for Economy, and also we have uh, uh, Shiri Gander, who is also the head of fiscal department in the Ministry of Economy. And uh, we have uh, Kamal Gander is also in, in the planning division. And uh, we have our debt person, Pankat Singh, and uh, Isoa Talamain Bao, who is the head of budget. So um, we'll just go into the major expenditure initiatives and the major revenue policies an economic update and issues pertaining to debt, etc., which a lot of people talk about without necessarily understanding debt. The budget was focused on improving the lives of ordinary Fijian families. Of course, it's a continuation of what we have done in the past. It's not just one budget being pulled out. It's uh, related to all the previous budgets. And of course, we've gone into what the budgets will be uh, going ahead to. Huge focus still on infrastructure development, uh, education, health, water, electricity. You see over here, Street lights will be put in over here. This is all part of the major infrastructure development. We go further down this way, and of course, being put up in Nabu area. It's all part of the infrastructure development that we are carrying out. Uh, also, of course, it builds upon the strong economic fundamentals that we have in place. So, what are the major initiatives? So, do you support for newborn, newborns and families? As you know, from the 1st of August now, if you have any family that earns less than $30,000 a year, if the baby is born, whether it's the first baby or the tenth baby or the seventh baby, whichever number of babies, they will be entitled to thirty thousand. Uh, sorry, they'll be entitled to one thousand dollars. And uh, you have to. I wish it was thirty thousand dollars. <laughs> but it'll be one thousand um, dollars. But the one thousand dollars, the way you get to use it is that the account must be open under the mother's. Uh, the mother will be sorry, the signatory. The account will be open under the baby's name. You have to register the baby. You have to go to birth, deaths and marriages and get the birth certificate. You then uh, indicate your preferred bank and then you open the account with the bank. You get to use the first $500 upon registration. So, you know, for example, you have to buy diapers, milk, whatever it is. You get to use the $500. The second $500 remains in the account until the child goes to year one of school. Because you know in year one, then you may need, you know, certain, you need access to money for certain expenses. Well, there's a couple of things. One of the reasons why we've done this, of course, is to help the families. Number two, the reason is that we want all babies to be registered. A few years ago, we went around Fiji, and we found that, that there's something like 25,000 Fijians who did not even have a birth certificate. Some people are as old as 40 years old, 50 years old, they still did not have a birth certificate. So this way, people do go and register their babies. Or some people, they register their babies when the child is about to go to class one, then you see everybody rushing off to BDM. That's why just before school starts, we have a long queue outside BDM. We have to open it on Saturdays, open late nights, so people register their babies to get entry into the school. The third reason why we've done it also is because we want people to have a culture of savings. We're not very good at saving money. So if you have an account under the baby's name, if you get some money, so maybe the baby turns one or two, some uncle, some relative comes, gives money for the baby. The idea is you put the money in the account. And we've made an arrangement with the banks that in that, from the time the account is open until the child goes to year one, there won't be any fees on the account, and, but the bank will pay interest. So the mother is the one that opens the, uh, uh, regulates the account in terms of taking it out. Now, we've increased... Maternity leave, we've increased the working days from 84 working days to 98 working days. So now mothers get a longer time to, for maternity leave. It's increased by two weeks. 
We've also now introduced uh, what we call, sorry, we've also now introduced what we call paternity leave. So fathers now of babies also will get five days off work. If, for example, the child is born or before your wife gives birth, you may want to take a few days off. Or after the baby is born, then you get five days off. So that's separate to your annual leave. We've also introduced what we call family care leave. That's another five days. Now, this is for when you, uh, you know, for example, if your child gets sick, uh, or your wife gets sick, or your husband gets sick, you are then entitled to take five, up to five days off. And this is, of course, paid leave. A lot of people, when their children get sick, or the wife gets sick, or the husband gets sick, they eat into the annual leave. They've got no other way. But this is another separate leave. So we've added this. Of course, we want people to be responsible about it. I mean, you can't take paternity leave unless there's a baby around. So obviously, that's the one way of control. But the family care leave, you know, don't take it off just because you want to go drinking grog or something. But we've given that level of responsibility to people. Now, we've also said that employers that pay for paternity leave and family care leave are entitled to have a 150% tax deduction. So they can claim from government a 150% tax deduction. So that's one way we're helping you know, businesses that will actually pay for this. We've increased funding for education. Education, this, in this budget, we're giving a billion dollars. 1.035 billion dollars. That's a lot of money. You can see how much money money was spent. For example, in 2004, they spent $270 million in education. In 2014 is when education became free. So like this school now, no child has to pay school fees. Right from early childhood education, right up till year 13. Then, of course, uh, we had uh, Cyclone Winston here. We've introduced some new funding. We also now have TELS. So if your child finishes year 13, does not get a scholarship, they can get TEL. So we pay for them to go to university, and they have to pay it back to us, and I'll talk to you about that later on. Of course, we can get a scholarship too. If they got a top mark in selected areas of study, we pay for the entire cost of their studies without them having to pay us back. Now, this is how we spend the one point, this $1.035 billion. So 534 so $535.4 million goes to the Ministry of Education. What does the Ministry of Education spend it on? The Ministry of Education pays for the salaries of all the teachers in Fiji. There's over 10,000 teachers in Fiji. So even though it's a school, say, run by a committee, like Rampur College, or run by a faith-based organization, we, pay, we still pay for all the teachers. So that's, you know, a lot of it is salary bill. From here comes all, all out also the payment of bus fares. You know, we pay the bus fares for children who come from low-income families. Uh, the milk, the free milk we give. And also, of course, the administration of running Ministry of Education. We give $123.8 million to the universities. Of that $123.8 million, $104 million is for what we call operating grant. So we give a grant, operating grant. To the University of South Pacific, we give them $33 million a year, approximately. This year we've given 33 million. University of Fiji, 4.2 million. Fiji National University, 65.1 million. Corpus Christi, Fulton College, Monfort Boys Town, uh, Sangam Institute of Technology, Viveka Nanda College, they get funding from us too. Then we have what we call a capital grant. Capital grant is we give grant to build things. So all the capital grants we're giving to, as far as universities are concerned, goes to FNU. We're giving them $19 million. We're building a new campus in Lambasa. We're upgrading the Sinu campus. We're building a livestock shed hospital for, uh, this is to do with the agricultural school uh, in uh, Coronivia. And then we're giving Maritime Academy $5 million. We are going to pay $90 million for the rehabilitation of all the schools. You know, Cyclone Winston, all the damages and all the, uh, uh, the damages from Kenny and Josie, we have to build that. So even though, for example, if Rampur got damaged in the cyclone, even though it's run by a committee, we pay for the rebuilding of schools. So we've done that for 225 schools throughout Fiji. We spend uh, $43.8 million for the national toppers this year. You know, those kids who get uh, scholarships, full scholarships. TELS this year will cost us about $205.6 million. <coughs> and of course, we have civil service scholarships and we have other scholarships of about $7.2 million. 
Now, we've increased the number of scholarships. So it's gone up from 630 this year to 950 scholarships this year, uh, in this financial year. These are in the areas that we have selected. Most of the scholarships we give for students are in the science areas. So mainly like uh, marine scientists, foresters, e uh, uh, economics, um, uh, doctors, engineers, nurses, uh, and various other areas of science, including things like, you know, surveying, etc. We've been introduced a new scholarship, uh, about 20 places, for those areas of studies that are not available. So if, for example, your son or your daughter finished year 13, and they want to do architecture, and they've got a place in the university overseas, because in Fiji there's no university that offers architecture. They've got a place in the university overseas, we'll actually pay for them to go and do architecture overseas. So areas like architecture, town planning, biomedical engineering, occupational therapists, clinical psychologists, speech therapists, nutritionists, forensic accountants, all these areas of study at undergraduate level is not available in Fiji. So 20 of the students can go overseas. Of course, we love to do more, but we have to live within our means. This is the start. So the national toppers altogether is 970 scholarships. We've introduced some new scholarships now also for civil service. There's a lot of teachers, for example, who have done diplomas. And they're very good teachers, but they need a degree. We want to upgrade our teachers. So we've said that we will give 30 awards for teachers holding a diploma to get a degree, a bachelor's degree. And we have uh, a particular, you know, um, slant towards that. So if they want to get a degree to do maths and physics, language, literature and English, information technology, industrial arts, special education, early childhood education, they'll get the preference, because we have a shortage in these areas. In fact, we have a very a huge shortage of skills sets of teachers in maths and physics and the science areas. Huge shortage. So we obviously want to make sure that we get more teachers, otherwise our children will miss out. We also have 20 awards for teachers to do, to upgrade to a postgraduate degree, to do like a master's or PhD. And the areas we want them to do that in is in English, maths, physics, and they are the three key areas we want them to do, or get into that space. I mean, I remember when I was in high school, which is a very long, long time ago, and over there we had teachers who had masters in English, for example, used to teach us at high school level. We need to get back that way of uh, that, those kind of qualifications at the secondary and primary school uh, levels. We also have 10 overseas awards for postgraduate studies based on public sector needs. We have um, another 50 scholarships for postgraduate studies for civil servants, 20 is reserved for civil servants and masters, this is to go overseas, in the area of teacher training, tourism, agriculture, fisheries and forest, and uh, PhDs, uh, for five for civil servants and five for other people. So we want the people in the private sector, we want to give them a scholarship too. They maybe have expertise in a particular area, in particular pertaining to uh, fisheries and forestry, tourism and agriculture, and we'll pay for that too, because we want people, more people in Fiji to be more qualified not just at a graduate level, but even going further than that. The reality is if we don't invest in our people now, our economy will suffer also later on. We've now also increased the funding for people with uh, you know, disabilities, people who are, we've been funding people with disabilities to go to university. So the allowances they'll get now will be in alignment with the current scholarship scheme. TELS, we've made some couple of changes, one of them in particular, so, for example, if your child uh, got TELS, we could also pay allowances for them if their parents earn $25,000 or less. But now we've increased to $50,000 or, or less. So if your family earns less than $50,000 and your child gets TELS, they also can get further allowances as part of TELS. And, of course, uh, we, sorry, we now give also, we've increased the bus fares to $30 a week for our students. So they maybe say somebody living here in Navua going to Suva every day if you're a child. So, you know, the bus fare, the previous amount was not enough, so we've increased it to $30 a week. And we've created this new position also where there are a lot of uh, people who may have, for example, got a graduate degree in science or pharmacy, and uh, they may want to do MBBS, become a doctor. So it's easier for them, they can get some cross credits. So we've now given 30 places for that, so people who've done uh, pharmacy or science, they can go on to become doctors. 
Now, tells, as you know, uh, a lot of people are going and saying, we'll make, you know, we'll get rid of your debt for tells, etc. It's all very, it's all plain politics. The reality of the matter is, ladies and gentlemen, that very few countries in the world make education completely free for everybody. It costs a lot of money. And those people who are talking about it now are just simply playing politics because they're only thinking about the now. Already, the debt from TELS has exceeded $700 million. And you can see the amount of money we've allocated only this year alone for national toppers and uh, TELS is costing us about $250 million. Now, the reality is that 50% of the entire Fijian population is below the age of 27. 50%. So we have to think about all these young people. They also need to go to university. They also need to get qualifications. And also when you have a young population, you have more people making more babies. Young people produce more children. So when you have 70% of the population today in Fiji is below the age of 40. So all you people over the age of 40, you're in the minority. All of us over the age of 40 are in the minority. People below the age of 40 are the majority. 70% of all Fijians are below the age of 40. So we have to ensure, because you've got a young population, we have to ensure that in 10 years' time, everybody that goes to university can get tells. Everybody who wants to go to university, if they can't afford to pay their fees, we will pay their fees. And that's very important. So you need to have sustainability. So what we have said is that if a person, for example, if I, uh, for example, am... Uh, uh, doing an undergrad study to become a teacher, my total university bill plus allowances, assuming I take full allowance, would be approximately about $34,000, $36,000. I'll be sitting somewhere here. That would be the debt. Now, as you know, if you come from a low-income family, we don't charge any interest. And then the interest goes up from 0. Point, it goes from 0%, 0 0.5, 1 1.5, maximum is 2 if you come from a very wealthy family. So there's very little interest rate. No bank will give you a 2% interest. So assuming your debt is there, say sitting at $36,000, what we're saying now, because we've been toying around with this for a few years, trying to get the best formula. So what we've said, if you pay your debt in three years or less, we will forgive 50% of your debt. If you pay 50% of your debt in three years or less, we forgive the second 50%. If you pay your debt... Between three to six years, 75%, we'll forgive the 25%. Pay 90%, we'll forgive the balance of the 10% between six to, eight years, six to eight years. The reality is that we cannot, with the amount that we get you to pay as debt can only be no more than 20% of what you earn. It's not we'll ask, be asking huge amounts. Whatever you earn, 20% of that is the maximum repayment you can make. So you can imagine... If you do the accelerated payment, you get rid of your debt very quickly because you get 50% off. And many people will be able to do that too. So this is one way. Now, the reason why we've also done that is because if this person here takes, say, 15 years to pay the debt, by the time you pay that $1 or, you know, the amount of money you pay, $15 in 15 years, the value of that dollar is not as much as what it was when we gave it to you in the first place. As you know, everywhere, every day in the world, a dollar changes every time. What your parents would tell you, you know, for one dollar before I could buy 35 Chinese lollies. Today you can buy one Chinese lolly, buy, you can buy one for one dollar, buy only five Chinese lollies. People say, oh, we used to build that home. My grandfather built that home 50 years ago for only $10,000. Of course, the world, that's how the world changes. So from our perspective, the sooner you pay your debt, we forgive more of that as, quicker, as, quick, as quickly too. We've set up a new Ministry of Housing and Community Development. We've given it a budget of $41 million. One of the reasons why we've done this is because we want more Fijians to own more homes. We have a very low rate of home ownership in Fiji. So we want to encourage people to own more homes quickly and at an earlier age. Generally, people buy their first home when they're about in their 30s or so. We want to encourage people to buy more homes quicker. So what we have done, we started this a few years ago, but we've changed it slightly. So if you earn less than $50,000 a year, we will give you a grant of $15,000 if you build your first home. Now, you'll see the advertisements in the Fiji Sun. It gives you, sets out the steps as to how you go about getting this $15,000. You have to go through a bank. 
and uh, then you make the application. If the bank say you can do the repayments, we'll actually contribute $15,000 towards you building a house. And it's a grant, so you don't have to pay us back. We're giving it to you. You need to go through the banking system. If you buying your first home, we give you $10,000. Now, if you earn more than $50,000, but less than $100,000, then we'll give you $10,000 or $5,000. $10,000 if you're building your first home, $5,000 if you're buying your first home. Now, if you see in the Fiji Sun, one of the things we've done is that we've said that if you buy from a developer that we have approved, and even though you're buying it, but it's a new home, we will give you $15,000. Now, one thing, ladies and gentlemen, you, it may not be a big deal in Nauvoo or around here. There's lots of land available. But we have to change the way that we think about house. We think when you say we want to build our own house or buy our own house, we think about one block of land and a house in it. But really, one of the other ways of looking at a house is like a flat. So you can have a big building with many flats in, uh, on each floor. And you can get a 99-year lease, what you call strata titling. So that is always much cheaper than having a house on a block of land. That could be a first house. You could be able to buy a first house with one bedroom or two bedroom flat, strata title, it'll be, lo it'll be much cheaper. Could be seventy, eighty thousand dollars. That could be a first asset. We want you to buy a first asset. A lot of people, because they don't have asset, when they want to go to the bank to borrow for a genuine reason, for example, oh my daughter's getting married, or got some funeral expense, three thousand, five thousand dollars. The bank say, okay, what can you give as mortgage? People don't have any mortgage, so they don't get the loan, so they go to the money lender. A lot of people in Fiji still go to money lenders, which is obviously not a good thing. So we're encouraging people to own more of their home, and this is what we are offering. We're also offering $10,000. If you earn less than $50,000 a year, again, you need to go through the banking system. A lot of people, for example, can get Itoke lease or state lease, but they need to pay the, need to buy the lease. So it may be $15,000, $10,000, or $20,000. We will help you and contribute $10,000 if it's your first land, piece of land. So you can build upon that. You know, there's a lot of people come to us and say, oh, you know, the uh, TLTB needs $12,000 premium to buy the lease. We'll contribute $10,000. We'll make the payment directly to TLTB. So you get a proper lease. A lot of people live in Vakavalu arrangement. We want them to get a proper lease. So we'll give $10,000 towards them. We've set aside $5 million. We also have, you know, uh, we started this uh, last year, that if you come from a low-income family and buying your first home, you can qualify for getting what they call a subsidized interest rate. So the Reserve Bank of Fiji lends to some of the banks for low-income families when they want to buy a home, home, they lend to them at 1%. And then the bank, they give the money at 1% to the banks, then the bank lends you the money, that same money, for 4.5% or 5%. They cannot charge anything more than 5%. What we have said now, if you are one of those people, we'll further subsidize your interest rate by another 1%. So if, for example, you go to HFC and they say, okay, we'll give you this loan, uh, it's your interest rate is 4.7%, 4.5, 4.2, we'll come along, you can make the application, we, you then minus it by another 1%. So for three years, you'll pay the subsidized interest rate. So if it's 4.2 originally, you'll now pay 3.2%. That's to make it less burdensome for you, because we want more people to own homes. Young people need to buy homes a lot quicker now. We also have set aside $750,000 to cover the cost of what we call land surveys. There are a lot of people who have an agreement to lease, but the land is not surveyed. The land, once the land gets surveyed, then they can get a proper lease. So we've set aside a lot of uh, those funding for that to expedite the issuance of proper titles. Of course, we're doing more of, uh, uh, you know, uh, formalizing informal settlements, and there will be some more announcements made on the one-third and two-third contribution scheme. <clears throat> now, one of the things that we have done, before I actually I should just put that back. At the moment, for example, if you wake up in the morning and you're not feeling well, and I'm assuming you've got the flu, there's a flu going around, cold weather, and you want to go to a doctor, you want some medicine. So over here in Navua, you might go down to the hospital. Now, in countries like Australia, etc., when you have that kind of minor ailment, you don't actually go to the hospital necessarily. You'll go and see your doctor, your local GP, your private doctor, what we call in Fiji private doctor. In a lot of countries they call them GPs or general practitioners. 
we will introduce that from the 1st of January next year. So if you, for example, get sick, there's a doctor in Pacific Harbor, you can go and see the doctor. And we will pay for that cost. We don't want you queuing up at Navua Hospital or the health center because it's not a major problem. So that system, obviously, is something we are currently working on to finalize that. It will make it easier for you. The GPs can, of course, you know, uh, see you a lot quicker. You don't have to travel a long distance. We want you to get accustomed to a local GP. Is there a doctor around here in Rampur, in this area here? Any private doctor? Pacific Harbor. Okay. So, once we do this, it will mean some other private doctor will have to come and set up here. Who knows, somebody might set up a, a practice over here in, in this area. Sorry? There's one in town. Okay, you might get somebody over here. Like the town of Korobo in Tailevu. It's a big town. It does not even have a private doctor. People go to Nasori or they go to the health center. See, in this way, we'll be encouraging more private doctors to come to places where there's pockets of population because they know they'll get money. We also have some funding set aside to encourage people to go to rural areas to set up their practice. Now, of course, it'll cost money for us to pay for your visit to the doctor. So how are we going to fund it? That's the trick. The funding will be coming from, at the moment, by law for the past 20, 30 years, or more than that, I think, every employer, they have to pay 1% of the salary bill to FNTC. You know FNTC levy. You have to pay 1% of your salary bill to that. That's your contribution towards training. You can then claim some of it back, but most people don't in particular small businesses because they don't make use of it. Or the courses aren't very good. So, we will continue to collect the 1%. But, 50% of that 1% will be used to pay for these visits to the general practitioner over here. At the moment, we collect $21 million a year from the FNTC levy. So approximately $11 million or so will go towards paying for the GPs. It will make it easier for you. So when you have a GP in your area, if you continue to go there, you go there, your husband goes there, your wife goes there, your children go there, they become your family doctor. They know your family history. You, beloved, you develop the relationship. That's what we're introducing from the first of Jan. And the way we'll fund it is through taking 50% of the FNTC levy. Now, we're also introducing from the first of Jan workers' compensation to be under the ACCF. As you know, in the last budget we announced, the third-party insurance will no longer be in place. The simply people will pay a levy and it goes to the accident compensation or uh, Commission of Fiji. So ACCF now, so for example, if a child over here, God forbid, if tomorrow morning they run in front of the bus, and the bus hits the child and dies, or some other vehicle, you no longer claim for third-party insurance. Before, the, the, under the old scheme, you have to go through a lawyer, they fight the case, they say, oh no, it was a child's fault, why did he run out in front of the bus? And they don't get a payout. Now, under the ACCF scheme with third-party insurance, we just have to establish the fact that the child died on the road, it was an accident, and the payment is made. You don't assign blame. Assign? You don't assign fault. That's why it's called a no-fault system. So from 1st of Jan, we'll also be doing the workers' comp too, we'll fall under that. So assuming that I'm working in a sawmill, and I'm cutting timber, and my finger gets caught and my uh, finger gets cut off. Under the, work, oh, under the current scheme, your employer has to go to report to Ministry of Labor. Your uh, employer may not have workers' compensation insurance. You might get lawyers involved, etc. It takes a long period of time. Under this scheme from the 1st of Jan, you at work, your finger got cut. There's a particular price for it. You get paid out. That's how the system works. You don't need to get lawyers. Of course, if you want to go and claim some more, you can but through lawyers if you want. And there's no fault. They won't say, oh, this guy, you know, he was talking to somebody else when he's put his finger in. That's why his finger got cut off. There won't be any fault assigned. You at work, you got injured, you get paid out. That's how the system works. So obviously to fund that, we're taking 40% of the $21 million to fund it. And the balance of the 10% will remain with the FNTC. We're also putting in uh, insurance, but we call bundle insurance for social welfare recipients and also civil servants and members of discipline force. This is very basic insurance. We introduced this for sugarcane farmers, 
rice farmers, copra farmers, dairy farmers, they're all covered under this now. Very basic insurance. It costs us only $50 a year for this insurance premium. But what do you get for $50? You get $3,000 upon death, who is the insured person, gets $3,000. And uh, then you get $1,000 for funeral expenses, $3,000 if your house catches on fire, and $3,000 upon personal injury. So the first group of people we are also insuring are social welfare recipients. You know, there are people who receive benefits, whether disabled persons or people below a particular income level, or you have pensioners, etc. Now, obviously, they, they may not be that well off now. So in this way, we're also protecting ourselves. So obviously, if a poor person is receiving social welfare, if, if the husband dies, who will the wife go to? They'll come to us. By this insurance, we can say, here's the money. If you're a poor person, your house burns down, they'll come to government for money. Say, so here's the money. So that's what we've done. We're also protecting ourselves, but it's a smarter way of dealing with things, rather than having to set budgetary allocation aside. Now, sorry, the other thing I forgot to mention, in this one, the workers' compensation one, we're also going to cover school injuries. So, you know, they, you'll find, you talk to some of the teachers, there's generally, or sometimes you have schoolyard injuries. You may have, you know, you recently heard stories of kids bashing up each other. They made the hospitalization, etc. It will cover for that. We've heard the stories of, you know, kids playing around in school, in primary school with pencils, and the pencil pokes somebody's eye. They've lost an eye. They need compensation for that. So these are the kind of things that we'll be doing through the ACCF too. Now, we're also working on um, uh, insurance products for cyclones. We've set aside a million dollars to pay the premium this year's budget. We hope to get the insurance product in place. Now, the way it works is what you call through parametric insurance. So, we're not going to go around in the, uh, you know, um, insuring every single house. But the way parametric insurance works, assuming this is Fiji, and that this is the path of the cyclone. If the cyclone went down this path, we'll say everybody's house in this area will get a payout. Those people will be covered under this, in particular low-income families. So every, we all go and assess each individual house. We'll say, everybody where the cycle went through, will get paid $3,000 each. That's it. You get paid out. So we don't have to fork out. Because you know it's costing us a lot of money. Um, home care, we've paid out about $110 million. Uh, health for homes after cycle of Winston, we've paid out $125 million. You cannot keep on doing this every year. So that's why we're looking at developing insurance products. In this way, Government is also protecting itself and also making sure everybody gets paid out too. We're doing that for crop insurance too, uh, hopefully by November this year. We're spending a lot of money in digital uh, revolution. As you know, um, how many of you have wirelessy now? Anybody got wirelessy? Yes, okay. Did you get your free boxes? Yes, you get free boxes. Those of you who don't have wirelessy, please get your wirelessy box. If you earn less than $30,000 a year, you get the box for free. You have to buy your own TV. We're not going to buy it for you. But you get your wireless box for free. And if you earn that, you simply fill out the form, you'll get the wireless box. Or if you earn more than $30,000 a year, you can buy the box. The box costs no more than $95 or $99. Some places are selling it for $80. Some places, sorry, some places are selling it for $90, $85. What does wireless give you? Wireless gives you at the moment eight free-to-air channels. You don't pay for it. The gentlemen who have the box, they don't pay a monthly subscription. All you get the box, that's it. You can flick as much as you like. And hopefully in time to come, you'll get more channels that will get added on to it. Well, this also means that we are looking in various uh, parts of the country where you can uh, have data go through that. So if you're living in southern Lao now, you can catch Wailesi. If you're living in Vikombia, if you're living in Rotuma, if you're living in the interior of Naitasiri or Ba, you can get Wailesi. You can get it either through the dish or you can get through what we call terrestrial means. So we spend a bit of money on that. We also are running Wi-Fi hotspots. So all university uh, FNU uh, campuses will get connected to Wi-Fi. We're creating what we call safe spaces. So if you go to Sukuna Park now, you will get Wi-Fi at much faster speed, your internet connection. Much faster speed and much broader bandwidth. And you get one hour free if you go and log on. So we're doing this all over the place. We're doing it in Suva, all the towns in Fiji, we're doing that. we still got to work out a place in Navua. Now, maybe when you become a town, we'll do it. But 
but that's that's the kind of thing we're doing to get people more people connected to internet services and of course we're doing what we call more mobile phone applications on the, on your phones so you can then by august uh, sorry by end of this uh, month you're getting various mobile phone apps. You can now lodge a complaint about government on this mobile phone. And when you lodge a complaint about something, you can track it where the complaint has gone to. You can also go on the mobile phone and look at all the government ministries and all the phone numbers, etc. From next um, uh, launch, we'll be able to also notify BDM about a baby being born. A lot of apps will be launched. So through this app through very soon, you'll be able to check your title number. You can then see, for example, if you're driving along and you see that uh, block of land, you want to check the title, you can go on your mobile phone app and check it. All of that will be available on this. We're also promoting electronic transactions. This is very important. You know, you may go to the supermarket and you buy, say, $100 worth of groceries or whatever it is. You may not have $100, so you take out your ATM card. Most people have ATM cards in Fiji now. So you swipe the card. When you swipe the card, that machine is called pause machine point of sale machine. So you swipe the card, when you pay the $100, there's a 40 cents fee that's charged to you. Right? But don't, they don't only charge 40 cents to you, they charge 30 cents to the shopkeeper. So the bank on each transaction makes 70 cents. We of course want more electronic transactions, but of course people won't use electronic transactions if it's expensive. So we have, a, we have an arrangement with the banks. The arrangement with the banks is that from the 1st of Jan of next year, the 40 cents will no longer will be charged to you. It will be free for you. But they'll charge 30 cents to the merchants. We're trying to get them to reduce it. We've got some money set aside as to how we can subsidize it. Of course, the point is that we want more and more people to use it. At the moment, for example, I can walk into a shop in New Zealand and I don't have any cash on me. I can buy a bottle of water with my card. You try and go in and buy one bottle of water with your card, they say no. Minimum sale, $10, most places. So we want to change that culture. And I'll tell you why we want to do it. Obviously, it's, it's, it's easier, it's safer. We need somebody, you know, if you don't have any cash, you don't have the ability to lose it. Or somebody cannot steal it off you, you just have the card. Now, apart from that, the other thing is that when we have more uh, electronic transactions done, it makes things easier for everybody. The money stays in the system. You see... If this is a shopkeeper, I have got an ANZ card. I have an ANZ account. When I charge $100, when I pay $100 to my card, the money goes from my account into the shopkeeper's account. And the shopkeeper may have a Westpac account. Money goes automatically into the account. Now, what, are, what does it mean? It means this shopkeeper does not have to go to the bank to deposit the $100. Saves them cost. The second thing is the money stays in the system. The money is not taken out of the system. When the money moves from, moves from one bank to the other bank within the system, it still stays in the system. When the money stays in the system, that means there's more money in the system. When there's more money in the system, the cost of money becomes less. So you go to borrow money, your interest rate will be less. Because everybody keeps on taking out money from the system, there'll be less cash in the financial system. So therefore, the cost of money will go up. If every, all of us did all our transactions from now, today onwards, in, in electronic form, there'll be more money in the system, the banks have more, uh, more cash in the system, therefore when you go to borrow money, it'll be cheaper. So that's one of the other advantages of having electronic transactions. We've set aside some money here, where we will subsidize those machines. Those machines that I talked about, cost about 500 Australian dollars to buy. So about 750 Fijian dollars. So we want to subsidize that and go to shopkeepers and say, look, why don't you have a pause machine? We'll pay for 50% of the cost. You see, because people do electronic transactions also, we know how much money everybody's making. So they'll pay the right amount of tax too. That's also very important. If we collect the right amount of tax, we can do more street lights, we can build more schools, more hospitals, more four-lane roads. That's how the system works. Our health system, of course, we're building, you know, a lot of, uh, putting in a lot of infrastructure. We're building hospital in Kayasi. We're doing 24-7 in Vale Levu, upgrading hospitals. We're also providing for, you know, specialists now. We're setting up two kidney dialysis centers where we'll pay 50% of the cost if people earn less than $30,000 a year. So the cost is $150 a visit. 
we'll pay $75 for those people who earn less than uh, $30,000 a year. There's a big song and dance being made about this. We're, we're speaking to Dr. Krishnan, who's the only nephrologist, you know, the kidney specialist in Fiji, and indeed in the South Pacific. And he has told us there's approximately about 600 people who may, na- who may need access to kidney dialysis. Let me tell you, there are more people in Fiji who die of heart attacks in Fiji than anything else. Cardiovascular problem is a big problem. A lot of people have congenital uh, heart problems also, and also lifestyle choices. This is why if you look at this public-private partnership we've got here, which we're setting up in Latoka and Ba, whichever is, will be the private hospital provider that will come and provide the services, we have certain conditions. They must provide 24-7 cardiovascular services, they must set up chemotherapy services, they must have what we call for cancer, they must also have on- oncology services. Part of the deal is they'll build a new wing at Latoka Hospital to provide for things like new operating theaters where people can come and view in particular students. Uh, the free medicine will continue, but this time around the hospitals will give the medicines up front and they'll invoice us too. You can see over here at the bottom of the screen how much money we are putting into medicine. You can see how much on average there was about 132 in 2004. Now we're putting in about $382 million into the hospital services. It also includes something like a 100% pay rise for many doctors. Initially it was 80%, now we're going towards 100% by having 10, 15% more increase for doctors because the reality is there's a specialist shortage in Fiji. A shortage of doctors, we have not looked after them, previous governments have not looked after them. We've increased the salaries, we want them to remain here. You know, if any one of us has a heart attack today, now, there's not a single Fijian doctor that can carry out open heart surgery in Fiji. Not a single Fijian doctor. Why? Because we have not invested in them. It takes about 10 to 15 years to become an open heart surgery. All the good ones went away overseas. We've got a couple of them now who are coming back to help us. But we need to invest. In the meantime, we need foreign doctors to come and help us too. Now, uh, Ministry of Sugar, we are of course providing you know, subsidized costs, etc. for sugar. One of the issues, of course, is that we believe in reducing your input costs. Some of you over here may be planting dalo, for example. Now, if I take, say, dalo as an example, if somebody's going to buy dalo off you at $3 a kilo, for example, but the cost of you to produce that dalo is $2.98, you're making a profit of only $0.02. Cents. Right? If tomorrow I come along and say, I'll give you $10 a kilo, no problem. But then your cost of making or producing the dalo is $9.50, then you're making a 50 cents profit. So what's the point of it going from $3 to $10? There's no, no point. So what we must do is look at what is your cost to produce the dalo and how we can reduce the cost of the, the production of cost. That's the key. So we've got some political parties going around, we'll give sugar $100 a ton. I don't know if it's going to cost you $90 to make it, what's the point? You'd rather get $85 a ton, and your cost of production is, say, $40. You're making a $30, $35 margin. Or maybe $50, you're making a $20 margin. So this is why we give subsidy in these areas, what we call your input cost. We also set up a sugar stabilization fund, which means that there is... Um, the farmers are assured of $85 a ton for the next three years. And we've in this fund, so for example, if the world market price for sugar is $75, but we've said $85, so the stabilization fund will pay the $10 difference. It may well be the following year, the price may go up to $95, but the farmer will still get $85, that $10 will keep, and the next time it goes down. That's what a stabilization fund does. It gives you that assurity of a particular cost or price you'll get paid. We're very excited about building a local goat meat industry. Many of you eat goats in Fiji. Many of you eat goat meat. You like goat meat. Goat meat is a lean meat. It's not a fatty meat. Now, but unfortunately, goat meat in Fiji has not been done on a commercial scale. So what we want to do is, for example, have goat meat available, frozen or chilled, available in supermarkets. At the moment, there's no system of production for that, in that, in that sense. You know, only if, uh, maybe about 40 years ago, we did not have frozen chicken, 40, 50 years ago. If you want a chicken, you can buy from somebody's backyard, or you grow your chickens yourself. Now, most people don't do it. 
they go to the supermarket and buy frozen chicken. If tomorrow Crest or Rooster Poultry shuts down, we'll have to import our chicken. We are currently self-sufficient in chicken. Chicken meat, I should say. But it's one or two companies that has made us self-sufficient. In the same way, we want to do that for the goat industry. We need to have people grow, uh, you know, grow goat meat, grow goats for goat meat. And the way that Crest works is that Crest does not grow all the chicken. They go to farmers, they go to villages, they take some chicks, they'll give to maybe a thousand chicks. He say, here's the chicks, give back a full-grown chicken after 36 weeks, we'll give you this much. That's how the system works. We do a similar thing with goats. You can give to villages, some farmers, they may have some other farming capacity, we'll give them some kids, what we call baby goats, you give them kids, they can grow that so we can have a goat meat industry too. Similar thing we want to do with the with the cows regarding borosolosis and TB, and you can ask questions on that, should you have any on that. The civil service reforms are continuing. Of course, we've got a, what we call the per, uh, performance management systems, where people will be assessed individually on their own performance, and they'll get bonuses, etc., paid uh, for that. We've also increased, for example, in this budget, increased funding for the provincial councils, bringing the salaries in alignment with the civil service reforms, and also the Itauke Affairs Board. The staff have also been given increments to make sure that their salaries are in, in alignment with the market. So, what have we done? You see this STT and ECAL, uh, very quickly, uh, before I open up the floor for questions, is if you go and stay at a hotel, if you go and rent a car, if you go and go to a cinema, or if you go to the pub to drink beer, if you go and eat at an expensive restaurant like in Denarau, you pay what we call STT and ECAL, Service Turnover Tax and Environmental Climate Adaptation Levy. Now, we collect that money, and then we have to spend that money specifically on environmental or climate adaptation measures. And by law, we passed a law last year where whatever money we collect from these two taxes has to be spent only in those areas. So you can get these brochures. It's also on the web page. It shows you how we spent the money we collected last year. So we spend money, for example, rural electrification, protection of the environment, connecting people to water, building seawalls. We have already moved three villages to higher ground. There's another 43 villages that need to be moved to higher ground. All this costs money. So we have to ensure how we fund it. For example, we give, uh, spend on money on cane access roads, farm roads, all of that. That's where the money comes from. Now, STT and ECAL, of course, is... Um, what we have said in this budget, those businesses that earn less than $1.25 million no longer have to pay STT and ECAL. So assuming you set up a small motel here, you've got four or five rooms, you don't have to pay for it anymore. If you've got a pub that doesn't have that many people that goes to it, as long as you make $1.25 million or less, you don't longer have to pay STT and ECAL. Again, like I mentioned, 150% tax deduction for employers and salaries and wages paid to employees during paternity and family care leave. Cost of, if you, if you run a small business, you train your staff, whatever expenses you have, you can claim it as 150% tax deduction. Um, we have, of course, uh, ICT area is quite big for us. We we're saying 250% tax deduction on research and development in ICT and also renewable energy. We've also expanded, uh, we give a tax holiday if you set up a business in the ICT area. So we've expanded the definition of ICT. In all of these areas, which I don't have to read out, but you can see that it's, you know, any of the work you do in ICT, you, you get those incentives. If you go to Suva, many parts of Suva, some of the places, buildings in Nabu, etc., looks very run down. So if people invest in their buildings, they uh, spend about a million dollars, above a million dollars, they'll qualify for 25% tax deduction. We are hosting the Asian Development Bank meeting next year. It will be the largest meeting to be ever held in Fiji. It's a huge honor for us. There will be something like four to four and a half thousand people that will come to Nandi for one week. Very big meeting. So if people want to sponsor that, we say that you can get also 150% tax deduction. If people bring in electric buses, they get a 50%, a 55% capital deduction. And also if you set up electric charging stations. We are working at the moment behind the scenes of getting electric buses in Fiji and also setting up charging stations because electric buses obviously are clean. They don't put uh, you know, uh, ox uh, the carbon dioxide into the air, what we call greenhouse gases, which also is good for the environment. 
A few years ago, if he imported fruits, you know, apples, oranges, etc., from overseas, the duty was 32 percent. We brought it down to 15 percent. Then we brought it down to 5 percent. And in this budget, we've announced it will be zero rated to make it cheaper for ordinary consumers. We've also reduced the duty on tea, tea that you drink every day. It used to be quite high. We brought it down to 5 percent. We've now zero rated the duty on tea. As you know, that we introduced uh, what we call a excise duty on uh, sweetened drinks or carbonated drinks, you know, things, the fizzy drinks. If you have a very high rate of diabetes, we don't want our children to drink too much uh, fizzy drinks. So we, uh, we put an excise duty, but what we found, a lot of the businesses were bringing in cheap imported fizzy drinks. So we've now increased the duty, uh, the duty rate to $2 per litre on that. Of course, cigarettes and alcohol went up by 15%. Some political parties are offering cheap beer too, just remember that. Uh, plastic levy has gone up from 10 cents to 20 cents. Now, this plastic levy, if you go to the market in Navua, the levy is not charged. It's only charged when you buy something from a supermarket or a shop or a pharmacy. Now, why have we done that? Because plastic is a very bad thing. It's causing huge problems for us in the environment. A lot of drain, etc. is blocking up, getting blocked up. So we've given people from 2020... There'll be a complete ban on what we call single-use plastic. So even at the market, there won't be any plastic bags available, but we're giving people now 18 months' notice. So please change your behavior in the next 18 months. Because by 2020, there won't be any plastic bags available. Some of you are old enough to know that before plastic bags came in, you had like bags, what do you call jolly? You had the sacks. That's what you take to the, to the markets. That's what people used to use. That's what we want people to use again. Now, you know, in Fiji, we, 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 of course, have a policy that you cannot bring in any second-hand cars that are more than five years old. So what we found, that a lot of the uh, car dealers were bringing in cars that were like four years and 11 months, four years and 10 months. The whole idea of bringing in, you know, sort of not that old cars is you bring in new technology. When you bring in new technology, that means there are greater fuel efficiencies there. You put less carbon output into the environment. So we've now just to incentivize that, we're saying if you bring a second-hand car that's two years or younger, instead of paying 32% duty, you'll pay 15% duty. So we have the duty. So hopefully it'll encourage more people to bring in younger cars. Same thing with taxis. As you know, the taxis, when they bring in cars, we charge them 15% duty. Now if they bring in cars that are two years or younger, the duty will be only 7.5%. You know, as you know, a lot of the taxis need to be upgraded. Very quickly, um, I want to show you how our economy has grown. You know how we, we, we talk in Parliament and we say our economy has grown straight for the, nine, for the last nine years. The impact of the economy growing every year has an enormous positive uh, outcomes. You can see the total value of our gross domestic product is the value of the goods that are produced in a country. In 1970s, it was $0.2 billion. You can see in 2008, it was $5.6 billion. Today, within that nine years, it's almost doubled to $11.3 billion. Why? Because it's been growing for the last nine years. I'll show you where. You see over here. So you see, before, even prior to this, we would have one year of growth then one year it would go down, minus, below, below minus it would grow up, maybe grow for two years and go down again. When you have up and down, the economy does not grow at a much faster speed. So over here, you can see for the last nine years it's been growing. This 0 0.4, of course, was during Cyclone Winston. So even though Cyclone Winston cost or um, we lost 1.3 billion US dollars worth from our GDP. 1.3 billion US dollars. Huge amount. Even though we lost that much, we still grew at 0 0.4. Traditionally, it would have gone down here, it would have gone down there. But because of the various economic policies we put in place, it did not go below zero. As a result of that, our economy has grown for the last nine years. We expect it to grow for another three years there. Now, what's happened is because of that? Our unemployment rate has gone down. It's gone down to 4.5%. We've had... 40,000 new jobs that have been created in the last five years. 40,000. 
If you look at the FNPF withdrawals, you see compulsory new membership, 20,795. Even if you take out those people who retired, we still have a net FNPF compulsory membership of 13,000. So this is the result of having an economy growing consecutively for the last nine years. So you can imagine what will happen if it continues to grow. Unemployment rate will come down even further. And you can also see the number of job advertisements has, has increased now significantly. Now, you know, a lot of people talk about inflation. How do we measure inflation? Inflation is measured when you take your, what we call everyday usage things, and you look at the price changes in that. There are three things that people use every day also, most people. Alcohol, tobacco, and kava in Fiji. Of course, they won't have kava in Australia because kava is not something that is, uh, you know, that they drink generally in a place like Australia. Now, there are a couple of things that affect the price changes. A lot of, some of it is beyond our control. Everybody in Fiji eats bread. People eat roti. You make cakes, you have bamba kawa, whatever, all of this. That's made out of flour. Where do we get flour from? We get it from wheat. Where do we get wheat from? Do we grow it in Fiji? No. We buy all our wheat from Australia. There are only two companies in Fiji that make flour. Punja and Sons, FMF. When they buy wheat from Australia, we can't control the price. So if the Australians are selling wheat today at $10 a ton, and tomorrow they put it up to $90 a ton, we have no control over that. That's the price FMF and Punjas has to buy at. When it comes to Fiji, you know those big silos they have, then they grind it and they make flour. The moment they make flour, that's when we price control it. Flour is price control item. We price control flour. So they'll say, look, now we bought our wheat at $90 a ton. This, we've used this much electricity. This is how many people we employ, blah, blah, blah. We have to make a 3% margin. The Fiji Commerce Commission will look at it. They say, no, no, you, have to, you can make only this much margin. They look at that. Then they set the price of flour. Same thing with fuel. We don't have any oil in Fiji. We buy all our fuel. We don't, there's a government buy it, but the fuel companies buy it. And most of them buy their fuels from Singapore. So if the price of fuel goes up, we have to pay the higher price. The price of fuel a few months ago was about 38 US dollars a barrel. Today it's at $65 a barrel, $63, $65 a barrel. The price of fuel in 2008 was 140 US dollars a barrel. We have absolutely no control over it. But we can only price control it once it lands in Fiji. That's what also causes inflation. Yeah, so we have to understand that. Of course, things like cyclone. After cyclone Winston, because of the fact that most of the banana plantations got damaged in Fiji, a small bunch of bananas in Suva that normally cost $5 was costing $20. Long beans was costing $5 a bundle after cyclone Winston. That's what adds to inflation. Kava, $200 a kilo. Now about $140 a kilo. So if you look at the rate of inflation here, in 2015, the rate of inflation was 1.6, of which 0.6 was alcohol, tobacco, and kava. The 1% was from other things like fuel, wheat, and various other products. Look at 2016. Inflation went up to 3.9%, of which... Alcohol, tobacco, and cover was 2.7%. Nearly three quarters of it contributed by alcohol, tobacco, and cover. 1.2 here, 2017. Again, out of 2.8% inflation rate, 2% was by these three items. The other item was only 0 0.8. Of course, now it's changed. Inflation rate is 4.6. It's gone, and uh, alcohol, tobacco, and cover is 1.7. The other is 2.9. Of course, the price of fuel has gone up here. The other thing you notice, you know, Commerce Commission, every three months, they give the price of fuel, the changes. It comes down, goes up, gas, etc. Normally you'll find when it's a winter in the no northern hemisphere, when the Europeans and the Americans are all feeling cold, they use a lot more fuel. They use a lot more gas. And because of the high demand for that, the pr world price goes up. So we suffer the consequences. You'll generally see that in the summer, the price of fuel will come down. Of course, things like a war in the Middle East and Donald Trump and all of that has an impact on the price of fuel. 
Now, foreign reserves. This is very important. A lot of people don't understand foreign reserves. Like this young man here, if I can take him as an example. He's wearing a watch. He's wearing this jacket. He's probably got gel in his hair. The shoe sandals he's, uh, he's wearing. Maybe a lot of the material comes from overseas. I'm holding this mic here around my head. This pointer, that camera, every single thing is made overseas. Every single thing is made overseas. These fans are made overseas. So when we buy things from overseas, they don't sell it to us in Fijian dollars. They sell it to us in Japanese yen, US dollars, euros, Australian dollars. So we need to have that much of foreign currency to trade with them. If you get short of foreign currency, you can't trade. And generally people say, oh, that country is going bankrupt, they don't have enough money. But that's what you need. You need foreign reserves. International benchmark will tell you, you see this is the number of months here, on the side here, that you should have at least four months worth of foreign reserves. That's the benchmark. Good place to be in. Four months worth of foreign reserves. To be seen to be healthy. 2006, we had only $515 million worth. We were only about 2.2%. Or 2.2 months worth of foreign reserves. We've of course grown. Today we have 2.1 billion dollars worth of foreign reserves. Now what is really interesting is this line here. This goes to show the number of months. You see over here in 2010 we had 1.3 billion dollars. If you go along it's about 4.8 months worth of foreign reserves. Today we have almost doubled 2.1 billion but it's only five months worth. Why? Because our economy is growing, people are getting richer, so they demand more things. You know, some people, when they get a salary increment, what do they go and buy? They may buy a new car. Is it made in Fiji? No. Made in Japan. We need more foreign reserves. They may buy a bottle of perfume. Where is it made? Not in Fiji. It's made overseas. They may buy a new watch. Made overseas. So this is what puts pressure on foreign reserves. You know, as I've said in other places, Every day in Fiji at the moment, somebody somewhere is getting connected to the electricity grid. Which is spending $50 million this year simply in connecting people to electricity. Even if you give them solar power. The moment you give somebody solar power, they say, I can buy my mobile phone, now I can charge my phone. Where is the phone made? Overseas. Somebody gets electricity, they get a microwave machine. First thing they'll do is buy a microwave. They buy a fridge. They buy a TV. None of those things are made in Fiji. So enough more pressure on foreign reserves. So this line must always be kept high. Very quickly, a lot of people talk about debt in Fiji without understanding debt. Now, you can see there are two ways of measuring debt. One is as a percentage of a GDP, and the other one is what you call in nominal terms. In other words, what's the dollar value? Now, one thing before I talk about debt, you have to understand, <coughs> nearly all governments in the world, in fact, you'll be hard-pressed to find any government in the world, that is not borrowed. When Fiji became independent, the Ratu Mara government borrowed money. They borrowed money, they have to start paying the debt. Then after the Ratu Mara government, you have the four weeks of Dr. Bavandra government. He would have to pay the debt of the Ratu Mara government, and also he would accumulate debts himself too. He was there only for four weeks. Unfortunately. Then the Rambuka government came in after the two coups in 87. So he incurred debts too. But he has to pay the debt of the Ratumara government and Dr. Bavandra government. Then the Chaudhry government came in. He has to pay the debt, everybody else's debt, and he incurs debt himself. Then the Garasa government comes in. Then he has to pay for the everybody else's debt, but he accumulates debt himself. Then the Beni Marama government came in. We pay everybody else's debt, and then we accumulate our own debts. When the Beni Marama government was appointed, the debt of the Fijian government at that stage was already $2.8 billion at the end of 2006. $2.8 billion. The debt today stands at $5.1 billion. This is Fijian dollars. Okay, that's the debt situation in Fiji. But as a percentage of GDP, it's been coming down. What does that mean? I'll give you an example. Assuming that you earn a hundred dollars and you go and borrow twenty dollars. So what would you say your debt to GDP is? Your debt is twenty percent of your income. Twenty percent. But somebody else earns five hundred dollars a week. 
and he borrows fifty dollars, two and a half times more of the other person. Two and a half times more in dollar value, in dollar value, but as a percentage of GDP, because you earn five hundred dollars, it's only ten percent. So as they say, the richer you are, the more you can borrow, the amount of money. So this is just putting it in simple terms as a percentage of GDP. So because the economy is growing, as I showed you earlier on, because our GDP is growing over here, you see, $11.3 billion, you have the capacity to borrow more. The question you need to ask is this. When you are borrowing, what are you borrowing for? Are you borrowing to have a party? Are you borrowing to put up one building that you may use only once a year? Or are you borrowing to put a four-lane road? Are you borrowing to put up electricity lights? Are you borrowing to build more schools, more universities, more hospitals? That's what you should be looking at. So you need to be looking at what the debt is for. If it, that's what you call a good debt. If the debt is to build things, then it's a good debt. If it provides services and builds up productive capacity. As I've given the example to many people, there are some people, for example, who are fishermen. They go out and catch fish. Then they come by the side of the road to sell the fish. $50 a bundle. They don't have any fridge. They don't have any cooling facilities. They've got no electricity. By lunchtime, he's getting worried because nobody's buying his fish. So you come along at 3 o'clock and say, I'll give you only $25. He knows that if he does not sell the fish, the fish will go bad. Or he might have to eat fish again tonight. Or he'll sell it to you for $25 or $20. At least he say, I'll get something. Or if he keeps the fish, otherwise he'll rot. The moment you connect him to electricity, he'll keep his price at $50. Because he knows he can keep the fish in the cooler. The same fish, if he does not sell, he'll put it out the next day, throw fresh water on it, you drive past the fresh fish for sale. $50. You've increased the productive capacity. You've increased his or her earning capacity. That's what you call good debt. You're increasing people's income. Now, let's compare ourselves to other countries. You can get these figures off from Google or Web Internet. It's all available there. Look at Japan's debt-to-GDP ratio, 239.2%. Singapore, 112%. USA, 107.4%. All these other countries. Look at Canada, 92.3% debt as a percent of GDP. Nobody says these countries are all failing. Only some silly people in Fiji are saying, we had 47% they say Fiji is into so much debt. So a lot of nonsense. Everybody wants to migrate to these places, even though the debt levels are high. Let me show you what does it in dollar term mean. Japan's total debt in US dollars is $11.8 trillion. The percent of GDP is 239.2. Singapore's debt is $332.7 billion. Now, you can see the reason why it's only 32.7 3, billion, but as a percent of GDP, it's 112%. Because the economy is smaller. You know, I was giving an example. When the economy is bigger, you obviously can ha have higher debt exposure. The most debt ridden country in the world, USA, $19.9 .9 trillion. That's their debt in dollar terms. US dollars. We are here, $2.47 billion. US dollars. So you see, a lot of these countries are here. You can see how much debt they have. You can get these debts. Now, this is an interesting country, Mauritius. I went there a couple of years ago, very similar to Fiji, uh, sugar-based, now moving into tourism in various other areas. Mauritius decided, because the price of sugar was going down and not many people wanted to get into sugarcane farming, etc., they decided to change the economy. So they did exactly what we are doing, but in a much grander scale than us. They started putting in four-lane roads everywhere, connecting people with electricity, internet connection, setting up IT parks, giving out land for free for businesses to come and set up in Mauritius. Mauritius is lucky in the sense they're very close to a, a very uh, a big continent, which is the fastest growing continent in the world, which is Africa. But of course, not many people think of Africa being safe. So Mauritius is safe. They invest a lot of money in law and order and all of that. So then they went out to international companies and said, why don't you become in based in Mauritius to service Africa? And this is precisely what happened. 
You find all the large international companies are based in Mauritius to service Africa. They went to India, they got two or three Indian hospitals to come and be based in Mauritius. So they went to the rich Africans, you say, you come and get your open heart surgery in Mauritius. Don't have to fly anywhere else. We look after you in the hospitals, first grade hospitals, and by the way, you can have two weeks holiday after that. That's what they've done. So you see, their debt level is 7.5 billion US dollars, almost three times more than us. But it's good debt because as a percent of GDP is 62.7, but they're making lots of money. They upgraded the airports, etc. So this is what you need to look at, and this is the situation of the of debt. You see, Australia, a percent of GDP is 41.1%. But the debt exposure is $517.3 billion. Obviously not higher than us because it's a bigger economy. It's a richer country. It can soak up that kind of debt. Now, a lot of talk about, you know, I think Rambuka was saying we're going to be sold to the Chinese and all that nonsense. No, this is the debt we have. These are the overseas debts. So, we have a debt exposure to Asian Development Bank of $348.5 million. International Fund for Agriculture, we owe them $2.2 million. World Bank, we owe them $148.6 million. Uh, the JICA, which is Japan International Corporation, $11.5 million. Exim Bank of China, $516 million. Global Bond, $416.2 million. That's 30% of our debt. Because about 30% of our debt is what we call foreign debt. Money we borrow from people from overseas, organizations from overseas. 70% of our debt is debt incurred onshore. Domestic debt. We like to keep it that way because when you have more domestic debt, you don't have what we call foreign exchange uh, exposure. Because normally if you borrow from somebody from overseas, you have to borrow in their like US dollars or whatever it is. So if the value of US dollar changes, then obviously you have to pay more. So we like to keep 70% of our debt domestic. Now, this nonsense about the, Japanese, uh, the Chinese taking over obviously cannot happen. We borrowed money from the Chinese... Um, uh, the last debt we borrowed from them was, 100, uh, was in 2012. The Gaza government had a small debt with them. They built up the ICT center near Berkeley Crescent. Then there are seven projects from which, uh, for which we borrowed money. And I can tell you what they are. The Namawalu Draketi uh, tasseling of the road, Buddha Bay tasseling of the road, Sawani Syria tasseling of the road, Valley Road in Singatoka tasseling of the road, Moto Road in Ba and the bridge, uh, we uh, got them to do that. One subdivision for housing authority in Tathirua and the building of the public rental uh, flats in Rewai. The seven. So, the, the, the claim that they can take over our ports and jetties is utter nonsense. Because normally, you can only do that if you have a mortgage. So if I go to the bank and I say I want to borrow money to buy this house, then the bank says I want to mortgage that house. In the event I default, then they can come in, seize my house, sell it, get their money back. You don't have that with gov uh, debt with governments. Governments don't mortgage their property. Now, one interesting thing before we come to the conclusion of this is that from 1980 to 2006, in the 27 years, the, all the governments, whichever government was there, spent $3.5 billion in capital expenditure. Capital expenditure is when, you, when they build things. You know when you build things. Operating versus capital is different. So, they spent $3.5 billion and the debt increased by $2.6 billion. From 2007, when the Benny Marama government came in, to, uh, to now, 11 years, which is the uh, Benny Marama government, the Fiji First government, capital expenditure is $7 million. We spent double the amount in infrastructure. And the debt increased by $2.3 billion, which is less than $2.6 billion. But what is really interesting, from that period in 1980 to 2006, Every time they built something, they borrowed 76 cents in a dollar. We have borrowed only 36 cents in a dollar. Why? Because we have more savings. Because of this. We have what we call operating savings. So you see, government collects money. And we spend money. There are two types of ways you spend your money. One is your day-to-day -day running. Your normal karja. Right? We've come here in the car, we have to pay for the fuel. We have to pay for all the civil servant salaries, my salary and everybody else's salary. The government goes somewhere, that's your day-to-day -day running. Buy photocopying paper, salaries of all the teachers, etc. That's all operating expenditure. If you take how much money you collect 
and take out your operating saving, your operating expenditure, you get savings. Then you use that savings to build things. And then when you need more money, that's when you go and borrow. This is how much money the government, previous governments have been saving. Very little. We started savings here. This year we expect to save one billion dollars. Because we're running government tight. In a tight manner. We mean kanjus. In a day-to-day -day running. Mamangi. In the way we run our day-to-day -day expenditure. Despite that, we're still providing good services, improved services, because we're trying to do things smarter. So with this savings, it means you have to borrow less when you build. This is why we are spending only, we are only, uh, sorry, borrowing 36 cents in a dollar when we want to build things. Now we spend about 40% of our budget on uh, uh, capital expenditure. So that's the summary. It's a budget for Fijian family, Fijian family orientated. You can see we've not done too much in respect of chopping and tariffs and all of that, only a couple of things. It builds on the previous budgets. In fact, many of the things that we put in this budget, if people are smart, they would have known that we'll do this. In fact, we, we predicted some of these things about two, three years ago. And some of the budget messaging we've done now, you'll actually see we're giving certain messaging for the future too. The economy, of course, is growing nine years in a row, and the fiscal posi position remains uh, very strong. Now, all of what I've said to you, you can go to the website and get this. If you go to the website, you actually can get this book here. Everything is here. This book has the detailed expenditure on everything that we are, uh, we are spending. So, for example, if I open up this page, it says Fiji Police Force. Program 1, Activity 5, Eastern Division. So you'll know exactly how much money the Eastern Division has got. It says over here. How much money we are paying for the salaries in the Eastern Division, how much money the special constables will get, how much money the kerosene allowance will be for the uh, police, telecommunications, incidental, stationary and printing, $50,000, power supply, $120,000, $20,000, all the expenditure is here. Every single division, every single department, every single ministry, every single sub-department, is, everything is here. So you can know that. So it's all there. The other thing you'll get, of course, is also these flyers. You know, we started putting this out in the Fiji Sun. Just given out, so, so this says over here, Fiji Roads Authority, how the money will be spent. So it tells you specifically, street lights, which road will be widened, which jetty will be widened. In the Western Division, for example, Rambuta Access Road, Matokana Village Road, whatever it is, everything is all here. So that's about the roads. The other one, of course, is here, you've got the water and sewage. This one, Water Authority of Fiji. It says which village, which settlement will get, how, much, uh, what, how many water tanks, what's the size of the water tank, everything is here. Of course, this one here is rural electrification project. Various things, including people to the electricity grid. So over here, for example, say Western Division. Hari Charan Sanjay Prasad. Uwuna Kawandra subdivision, Korovuto Nandi. 13 people, that's the cost of it. So they'll get connected this year. You've got, uh, you know, Batia, Atada village, oh, sorry, yeah, Ambada village, Lotoka. How many people live there? 37, that's the cost. Everything is here. I've had people, you know, we've been doing this for the past couple of years, I've had people ring me up and say, hey, you've got this list, oh, my village has not been connected yet. When will I get connected? So it creates a lot more transparency. All of that is there, so you can see that. And of course, we've got all the other expenditures, the social services, uh, your infrastructure services, economic services, and of course general administration. So all that information is there, ladies and gentlemen, you can get access to that. Please feel free to do that. If you have any queries, you can also email us. So now I'd like to open up the floor for any questions or queries. If you have any personal matters, please don't ask it now. You can meet me after the, the session on the budget and we can talk about it. I've got my staff that can take down the details also. But if you've got any questions related to the budget or anything about the economy, please feel free to ask. They've got people going around with the mics and we can deal with it then. Okay? Naga, thank you.